All right, so the time is coming where we finally sit down and talk about how I PR'd my marathon. I mean, it was my first marathon, but it was still a PR. Yeah, I just wanna be great. Yeah, I just wanna be great. Yeah, I just wanna be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi everybody, my name is Matt and this is What Matters to Matt and yesterday I want to talk about racing and I want to talk about running my first ever marathon that I ran just this past weekend. It was an amazing experience. I've shared with you everything that I've done over the last number of months. Uh, if you haven't seen any of my other videos, head on over to my channel after watching this video. If there's anything there that you like, even if you're liking this video, please consider subscribing. It's free to you. It motivates me. Everybody wins. Let's move on to talking about exactly why we're here today in my whole marathon experience. So I think it's important to just briefly talk about exactly where I came from when it comes to my experience prior to this marathon training. Over the last couple of years, I have made a number of changes in my life. I lost about 80 pounds. Most of that came from dieting and lifting weights in the gym. I was never really a cardio person, but I found running uh, about a year and a few months ago when I needed something new, a new challenge, and I decided I was gonna sign up for a half marathon. Never dreamed of ever running a full marathon at that point. But as soon as I decided that I wanted to sign up for that marathon, I made one video about it, and I'll put a link to this video up here, but basically, it works out to that I got super pumped, super excited, didn't really pay any attention to how hard I was running, ran everything way, way too hard. Got about a week into training. My knees really started to hurt. I gave up on it. That was it. Nothing more on my channel about running uh, the half marathon at that point. I never, never actually registered for it in the end. Fast forward to this past fall, started to do a little bit running, watching a lot of Nick Bear, Embrace the Suck, the hybrid athlete programs, decided that I wanted to do a little bit more running and mix it in with my weight training. It seemed like a really good balance for me. And eventually I got to a point where I thought, you know what, if I really, really trained really hard and I set the goal, I could run the marathon come May, a full 42.2 kilometers. Bizarre at the time, but I thought, what the heck, let's give it a try. I need a challenge. I like doing hard things. So that's what we did. Now let's fast forward to just a few days before the marathon. There are a couple things here that I'm going to breeze over, but I'm going to do whole other videos on these by themselves. One of them is the taper. If you have never tapered for a marathon before, you need to trust in the process. Tapering for the marathon was one of the hardest things of the entire program that I did. I felt very sluggish. My body didn't really know what was going on. Ultimately, towards the end of the taper, when those last three or four days, if you're doing a proper carb load, or at least what I felt was a proper carb load, carb load, you start to feel a little bit sluggish. It was even in the day before, during the shake run last couple of miles that I did before the race, I remember after that messaging somebody and going, I feel kind of horrible. I'm feeling very sluggish. And they just kept saying, trust the process, trust the process, trust the process. Race day morning came and I felt great. I felt properly tapered. A lot of those little niggles that I had had going on before were completely gone. So I felt great. And in terms of carb loading, and again, I'm going to be going over a whole video on this, but basically it comes down to uh, over the last couple of days, the last three or four days before the marathon, I transitioned to eating mostly carbs. I am somebody who eats a fairly high protein diet, but I transitioned to eating mostly carbs over those last number of days. Even probably a week out, I was starting to ease into eating a whole lot more carbs. Of course, as I've been going through my training, there have been a lot of days, mornings before long runs where I've eaten a lot of carbs. Even when uh, the, during that carb loading phase, Every single day, it helped to have my breakfast be the exact same thing that I woke up and ate on that marathon morning. Today is the day. I've got a little bit under two hours before I step off that start line for my first ever marathon. Looks like the weather is going to be great. It's right around zero degrees, but I'm going to eat some breakfast, get my bagel in me, my peanut butter, my banana, my honey, my coffee, my Gatorade, and we're going to get over to the race and we're going to see how it goes. And the next thing I want to talk about is sleep. And I wanted to pay really close attention to this in the weeks leading up to the marathon. Actually, during my entire taper, I was paying really close attention to what my Garmin was telling me about my sleep. It was tracking my sleep. I wanted to pay close attention to how my body battery was doing in the morning relative to the end of the day. I wanted to see how that all worked. Now, on the night of, I didn't actually have my Garmin to track my sleep. All I can tell you is that I got next to no sleep the night before the marathon. I was so amped up. 
I, the adrenaline was pumping, there were a lot of nerves there, and I was thinking a lot about the race, so I didn't get a whole lot of sleep the night before the marathon. What I did do was, after watching a video by Ben Parks, uh, just actually just a few days before that, one of his suggestions were to make sure that the day before was going to be the day that you got a decent sleep or that you got a really good sleep. That was most important. So the Friday night for me, focus on getting an absolutely in incredible sleep or a really good sleep so that come Sunday, I was going to feel as fresh as I could knowing that Saturday night, the sleep just wasn't going to be there. Okay, so now we're on to the morning of the marathon and it was a pretty chilly morning, but it was something that I was expecting leading into this race. I had actually met with somebody before the race, a few days before the race who had run this particular marathon. It's one of the benefits of doing the race in sort of your own community. I was able to find somebody who had lots of experience and I trusted that I've known for a long time. And we went over the race and one of the things he suggested was that I actually went out to the dollar store and just bought an oh, cheap, really, really cheap pair of socks, cut the ends off them and use them as sleeves. Now I was wearing an old sweater when we got to the start line. It was around the freezing mark, right around zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. If I'm wrong on that, I'll put that up here on the screen. But it was right around the freezing mark in terms of temperature when we started out. But it was a nice sunny morning, so I knew it was going to warm up fairly quickly. I knew I was going to warm up fairly quickly. But having these socks on my arms to start the race after about three or four kilometers, when I finally got really warmed up and comfortable, I was able to just take them off, toss them aside, not worry about them. These weren't expensive sleeves, anything like that. It was just something that I could throw away and forget about. So it makes sense at this point to talk about how I did not carry my GoPro during this actual run. I brought this up in one of my other videos. Right before I went to the start line, uh, I talked to my wife and I said, you know what, you have the GoPro. There's this thing where when it's your first marathon or your first time doing something that you've been leading up to, you just really want to focus on that thing. And I wanted to make sure that I experienced every part of this marathon and I didn't want to be thinking about filming at all. So I gave her the GoPro. I also, there was a little bit of nerves there. I just wanted to get as much of that out of the way as possible. So I gave her the GoPro, got in the starting line. When I got to the starting line, I lined up just behind the four hour pacers. Now my goal pace was six minutes per kilometer, which would have me in at about four hours and 13 minutes. And the other thing to consider here was there was about a thousand people that were starting at the same time. Three, two, one. Yeah. This included not only the marathon people, it included the half marathon people and the 10K people. We all started off Sunday morning at 8 a.m. So we all started off at the same time. There was just one big group of us. So really not paying attention to the people that were around me in terms of what race they were running. We got started out a little bit quick, which is a very, very common thing. If you've ever talked to anybody that's run a race, that's something that a lot of people do. You're well tapered, you're feeling really well, the adrenaline's really pumping, it's really easy to start off quick, really easy to get caught up in the crowds, and, and I did that. We all started off a little bit quick. Now, would I do the same thing next time around? Probably, I mean, if I was trying to be really, really cautious and patient and with my start, I might uh, be a little bit more conservative, start off a little bit further back, because I think even if you're starting off with a group that's planned pace is a little bit slower than yours, that might bring you up to starting off at your goal pace because pretty well everybody starts off a little bit quick. But the one problem there, the one big thing that you have to consider is that if you're starting off further back than the folks that are planning to run, eventually run the same pace as you, that means that you've got a little bit of ground to make up and lots of moving pylons in people to move around and dodge around and just wasting time and energy doing that. So it's, it's not the best plan in the world. So I don't know if it's something that I would do. But it's something that you could consider if you wanted to be extra cautious starting off with your marathon. So as I said, the first few kilometers, we got out a little bit quicker than I wanted to. And I looked down and my heart rate was pumping a little bit faster than I wanted to. And so I really kind of just settled down, got in a groove, got on cruise control, didn't pay close attention again to who was around me in terms of what they were actually running. One of the benefits, and I'll talk about this again in a bit, but one of the benefits to doing so much of my training on my own or all of my training on my own is is that it's really 
not easy for me. Parts of it are harder because I'm just not used to having other people around, but I don't have any dependency on other people at all. I can kind of just zone out, run my own race, and that was really beneficial when I kind of realized I had to just back it off just a little bit and get in the groove and run at the pace that felt comfortable for me in that moment. So a lot of this race was kind of fairly uneventful and it wasn't until about the 10 kilometer mark where I first saw my kids and I saw my wife and they were holding up that big sign and I was able to tap the mushroom, get a little bit of a power up. It was just a really good feeling because I was finally had some confidence. We were rolling, everything seemed to be rolling smoothly. It was just after seeing them that I first bumped into one of my friends who I had been meeting with about the race. He was on the race. He was handing me some stuff during the race. He had a couple of goos for me, a couple of gels and a bottle of Gatorade. So I didn't really have to worry about drinking Gatorade at the water stations. I could just worry about water, but it was nice seeing him. He's able to give me a little bit of an update on how I'm doing, give me some extra confidence. From there, we rolled on to this one section of the race. Now, one of the great things about running the race in your own community is when you're doing your training, you have lots of opportunity to actually run the route or run pieces of your actual race. So I had been doing that, but there was one section of the race that I hadn't actually run before. But at the same time, this was the one section where there was an out and back where you would be crossing paths with people coming the other way. And since I wasn't my own community and I had known so many of the other runners that were in there, it was just really encouraging to see pass by so many different people that were like, you're doing awesome, Matt. You're doing great. Hey, what matters to Matt? Awesome job. Keep going. You're looking smooth. All of these things happening gave me this extra boost of confidence. And honestly, the closest I had become, the closest I had felt to being like a part of the running community happened during that race because I hadn't, I hadn't felt that before this. I'd been running everything on my own. So I hadn't, I hadn't really been part of this community other than the online community that I've been sharing with you. So we're cruising along really well and it wasn't really up until the halfway point where things started to feel quite a bit different. Now, early on in the race, since it was the 10K, the half marathon and marathon people, and it was around a thousand of us, I think that's about the number. But anyways, the 10K people were long gone and since it was two loops of an out and back, you pass by the finish line for the half marathoners who eventually was your finish line and they're done. There's lots of cheering, announcers announcing names and all that. And then you're on your own. And there were only about 200 marathoners that were actually in the race. So that spread out over that second half, that second uh, 13 miles felt a little bit lonely at times. But for me, what was great about this was that I was so used to running on my own. That was where my comfort zone was. So when you actually got on the back half of this marathon, being able to put my head down, I was listening to a little bit of music in one ear, felt very much like training, felt very relaxed, very smooth, and I was just able to keep a consistent pace and just push forward that uh, I wasn't used to having people around me to encourage me. That wasn't how I did my training. So, so there was a certain benefit, a little bit of a bonus to doing so much of the training on my own was when it got lonely, I was comfortable. But there was this point, and I bring this up because again, this is all unknown territory for me when it comes to running a marathon. There was this point just after the halfway point. Now, I've got some of my shoes uh, back there on the shelf. I've got uh, the Endorphin Speeds and the Triumphs back there. Some new shoes we're gonna talk about that I just got the other day. That's another video. But the Endorphin Speeds were what I wore on race day. Now, leading up to race day, one of the biggest niggles or problems that I had was actually with my feet. And I was a little bit worried about running the entire marathon with the endorphin speeds. So I had this point just past the halfway mark where I was gonna meet with my kids and meet with my wife. I was gonna meet them on the trail. And my daughter had the Triumphs, my big uh, max cushion shoes with her. And she was gonna hand those over to me and I was gonna change the shoes if my feet were feeling bad at all. And I just felt like I needed a lot more soft and cushy feel if things weren't going as well as, as I was hoping they were. But that didn't happen. I was floating right along. Everything was feeling great. It was actually, honestly, the best my feet had felt in months was, uh, was at that point. So things were going good. I was having a whole lot of confidence. I was right in the back half consistently. And then we hit the wall. Now, when I say we hit the wall, I didn't actually hit any kind of a wall during this race. It was just something that I had heard of so many times in researching for this marathon. One thing I do a lot of when I get into something is I spend more time than most 
researching and thinking about exactly what I need to do to be successful in that thing. And every single time I talked to anybody about the marathon or I looked on videos about the marathon, one of the things that they warned you about in terms of the actual race, apart from just nutrition, along with nutrition as part of it, is be careful of the wall. And the wall always comes around 20 miles. And in fact, in a video, just one of the previous videos I put up, maybe just two videos ago, I talked about that my splits at mile 20 would be the fastest splits of the day that I would do, unless the wheels completely fall off. If you look back at my splits after the marathon, mile 20 to mile 22 will be the fastest splits of the day for me. Uh, kilometer 32, because I was tracking everything in kilometers. So between kilometer 32 and kilometer 35, I had committed in my head that those are gonna be the fastest three kilometers or the hardest that would push the entire day, both mentally and physically to break through that wall. Turned out to be, on this day at least, uh, a really good strategy it was that was when I would really turn on the pressure or turn it up a notch. Whether I'm gonna do that in the next race, I don't know. I've kind of, uh, in a way I've gotten past that mental barrier a little bit because I've actually felt it, I've actually done it. Didn't really hit a wall. Of course it started to hurt in those later miles, but I didn't have it come on suddenly. I didn't suddenly slow down. I didn't suddenly want to stop. That was something that just kind of eased in over the miles as we got into those later miles. So then we're kind of into the home stretch. We've got that last seven or so kilometers, that last four or five miles. And I found myself in a little bit of an odd spot. I mentioned earlier in the video, I mentioned in other videos that my pace, if I could hit six minutes per kilometer, that would have been, ultimately that would have been my goal pace. And I was ahead of that pace by a few minutes. Thank you, Garmin Pace Pro. I'll put the video to how to set up the Garmin Pace Pro up above. But I was ahead of that pace by actually probably seven or eight minutes at this point as we got later on in the race. And so I was moving along pretty well, but what that also meant was that I was about five, six minutes below that four hour, breaking the four hour mark was ultimately a goal that I wanted to do at least by the end of this year was break four hours. So I found myself in a little bit of a no man's land because I knew I didn't need to push to make that six minutes per kilometer pace, which is a goal. And the next goal I had was, it was a pretty big window because the next goal I had was down to break four hours. And I didn't have enough time. There wasn't enough distance left in the race to make up that time. So I was in a little bit of a no man's land in terms of pushing hard. I didn't, I don't wanna say I didn't have a reason to push hard. Ultimately just running the best race I can was a reason to push hard. And this is the funny thing about marathons. If you haven't experienced this yet, it is an amazing feeling. And I think one of the things that for me coming out of this, I felt that where I achieved the most was in that last few miles when mentally you're really fatigued, physically you're really fatigued, your mind is telling you that you need to stop, your body is telling you you need to stop, and you just keep pushing through. Having the mental strength left to tell yourself to keep pushing through. I never really dropped pace during this whole marathon. In fact, I ran pretty even splits. At the end of the day, my second half to this marathon was only a minute off my first half. So I ran pretty even splits and pushing through that mental barrier, getting through that mental block was, was a huge, huge moment for me and one of the biggest takeaways I have from this race. And lastly, I wanna talk about turning that last corner. When you see that finish line, we were just a few hundred meters away from the finish line. And one of the things that I had asked to a number of different social groups a few different times, one of the things that I found most bizarre about marathon runners was that when you get towards that finish line and they're taking those pictures of people who are just close to finishing their marathon, just how happy and refreshed people seem to be. And I never recognized that Never thought that was actually possible until I turned that last corner. I always sort of envisioned this idea that you've been sort of putting yourself through an awful lot over a number of hours and you're gonna be physically exhausted, physically drained. And how are you gonna look so happy and so just, just fresh like so many people do when they're coming into the final few steps of their marathon? but there's just something about it. It's such an amazing feeling. I uh, crossed that finish line, got the chance to get my medal, and then where it's a smaller race, one of the cool things is you get, you're really close to seeing uh, the people, the important people, ultimately my family, who are right there to greet me not long after crossing the finish line. 
I met up with a couple of people that are, were far more experienced than I am that uh, met with me after the race, had me not sit down. We walked around for about 45 minutes or so. Uh, it was interesting at that point. I took some water, had a banana, had some chocolate milk. Uh, that It was kind of like for about half an hour after the race that the lights were turned off. I don't know how else to describe it. It just was kind of really dark. Didn't feel like I was gonna pass out. It was just, things were dark. My vision was, uh, I had lost my vision just a, a little bit. That went away after a while. Took a lot of walking around, took the advice to not sit down. Now it wasn't long after that that I had to get home, have a shower, and uh, go to my daughter. My 11 year old was playing a song downtown here. I'll link to that video here because I talked about that in my last video. But walked around, vision started coming back, realized at that point what I had just done, realized at that point I had meant pretty well every single one of the goals that I had set out to achieve. And it was just a great experience. All right, so that is it. That was the marathon. Now I'm gonna go throw the marathon prep series that I have up here. Also, if you like this video, please consider subscribing to this channel. My name is Matt, and ultimately what matters to me most is my family. I will see you in the next one.